Thank you all for coming. I am Megan Brackham-Narby. I'm going to talk to you today about how to take care of all of the stuff that you own. Well, probably not all of the stuff that you own. I'm going to specifically talk about the stuff that you own that you want to preserve for a long time. So the stuff that's really valuable to you, that's meaningful, that's special, that you want to take care of. Um, the stuff that I'm going to say isn't really applicable to like, like your sheets or like the, your paperback books that you read or things that you don't care that much about keeping, but like the things that really are valuable, that's the stuff that I'm talking about. And my background is I am the outreach conservator for the Minnesota Historical Society. I trained specifically in conservation, which is a field of study specifically about the preservation and long-term care of material things. So uh, like basically how to maintain and preserve things for a long time in the future. Um, and that's a specific field of study that I have two master's degrees in, so I have a lot of education about this stuff. So this is my contact information. I also have an easier email address that you can send things to if you forget how to spell my last name um, or if you lose my business card, which is out front, but I'll get to that at, at the end. Um, whoops. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to have three main sections. Um, we're going to talk about, first, how to preserve and protect the things that you value. Two, recommendations about how to find more resources. And then three, we're going to have a nice long time to ask questions, and I'll answer them. That's really important to me. I love ask, answering your questions, so I'm going to try to talk really fast and, ans and provide as much information for you as possible in the first part of my presentation so that we can have lots of Q&A time at the end. And because I don't want you to be frantically scribbling down notes the whole time, I provided you with this handout so that all of the information that's in my slides you have on the piece of paper in front of you, you don't have to try to write down a bunch of notes and then I can talk as fast as I want um, and you don't have to try to keep up. So you have all of the information in front of you. So, how to preserve and protect the things you value. In conservation, we have this neat little framework to think about preserving and protecting our stuff called the 10 Agents of Deterioration. And this is a nice little framework to think about preserving things um, because it helps us think about like what are the main ways that things start falling apart and how can we protect against those things to keep them safe. Um, it is uh, designed, it was created by uh, an organization called the Canadian Conservation Institute, which is a government organization in Canada that just does research about conservation. It's very cool. Um, and it's been around for a long time. Conservators talk about it all the time. But when you think about the 10 agents of deterioration, you're probably like, agents of deterioration? Um, but that's not the kind of agents we're talking about. The agents of deterioration are more like this. We've got sort of things that you can imagine causing damage like fire and water. And then we got things that you might think about, oh yeah, I could see physical forces and pests causing damage. And then there's probably things that you would never think about causing damage like dissociation. You're like, what's that? I'm going to talk to you about what that means. And then at the end, you'll be like, oh yeah, I know what dissociation means. So I'm going to go through these one by one and explain what it is, uh, what it looks like, and what you can do to prevent damage from this agent of deterioration. So number one, physical forces. Physical forces are basically any kind of damage caused by a physical action. And that action could be impact, it could be vibration, pressure, or rubbing, anything sort of physical. Uh, it can cause damage that looks like dents, tears, cracks, chips, punctures, distortion, breaks. Um, the sources of damage from physical forces it can be a lot of different things. It can be something that happens like sort of a gentle action that happens all the time, like something that you handle regularly. So if you pick up a silver cup all the time, you might cause gentle rubbing that happens a lot, very frequently. 
but if you pick up something very infrequently, but then you drop it on the ground, that is a very severe amount of damage that happened just once. So there are also big events like earthquakes or disasters that can cause a lot of damage, physical damage, all at once that are hopefully will never happen to us in Minnesota, but um, sometimes disasters do happen. Other sources of damage include shipping damage. I'm sure people have experienced things breaking when they get shipped, construction vibration, vandalism, but gravity and handling are the most frequent causes of physical damage. I like to include this picture of a book because it's pretty um, intuitive to us when you buy a brand new book and you want to open it for the first time you know that if you open it really harshly, you can crack open the spine. But if you open it really gently, you can read it without cracking open the spine. You can read it and turn open the pages and just gently open it. This is true of our objects too. We can have gentle methods of handling that don't cause damage. Another way that we can protect our objects is to make sure that we're always placing them on a stable surface. So if you have something that's very valuable to you, make sure that you're always placing it on a table that's not rickety or displaying it on shelves that are firmly attached to the wall and not likely to like come collapsing down on like uh, a random day or when your grandchildren are in the room and messing around or something like that. Um, another tip that I like to give people is to make sure that whenever you pick something up, You've already planned your actions, so you know exactly where you're going to put it down afterwards. So it's very common to pick something up and then get to a door, and the door is closed, and then you're like, how am I going to open this door? My hands are full with the item that's in my hands. So if you've planned ahead of time, you've already opened the door, and you know that you don't have to put the object down halfway through in order to open your doors. And you've already cleared a space for your, you to put down the book once you've gotten to the space. These sorts, of, I, these sorts of strategies are just like easy tips to make sure that you don't accidentally damage something through simple handling and ways to move things around. Simple things can provide great impact on our preservation of our things for physical forces. All right, moving on from something that happens every single day that causes a little bit of damage every single time to something that hopefully will never happen, but if it does happen, could cause catastrophic damage. We're talking about fire. Fire damage might be caused by the smoke. It could be caused by soot. It could be caused by extreme heat, but most often, fire damage is actually just water that is being used to extinguish the fire. That uh, is usually uh, a component of fire damage, is the water damage, because when you have a fire, you also have water that you're using to put out the fire, especially fire hoses use a lot of pressure, and so then there's also pressure attached with that water. If you're lucky, those are all the forms of damage that you have if you have a fire. If you're not lucky, you don't have anything anymore because everything has been destroyed. Fire damage could look like charring, staining, melting, cracking, shattering because of extreme heat, and water damage, like I said. I like to point out that the most common causes of house fires, according to FEMA, are cooking and faulty heating equipment. So those are just two tips to keep in mind. When it comes to fires, the most important thing to know is that preventing a fire is the most important thing that you can do to prevent damage from fire. There's very little you can do after a fire to return an object that has been damaged by fire to its pre-fire damaged state. If you're lucky, it hasn't been destroyed by the fire, it's only been damaged by the fire, and uh, if you're unlucky, it's completely gone. And all we can do is try to prevent fires from happening in the first place by using smoke detectors, fire extinguishers, fire blankets, and other tools and methods to prevent fires from happening in the first place. I also want to really stress 
as an official, official spokesperson right now for the Minnesota Historical Society, as an official spokesperson for the National Heritage Responders, as an official conservator, I don't know how many times I can stress this, human life is always, always more valuable than the things inside your house that you're trying to protect. No matter how valuable your things are inside that you want to go and save, your life is always more important, so never go in to try to save a thing instead of saving your own life. Always wait until the fire is out before you go try to save something. Um, after a fire has happened, if you have something that's been damaged and you have questions about how you can try to save it, I do want to point out the National Heritage Responders, who I just mentioned. The National Heritage Responders are a national organization of a bunch of professionals who are specifically trained in responding to disasters that affect cultural heritage and stuff, stuff like that, um, from a, a lot of different backgrounds all across the country. And you can email them and be like, this thing just happened and I'm really stressed out and I don't know what to do. And they'll respond and they'll give you advice. Um, and it's super helpful. So that's their email address. And it's in your handout and I'll mention them again. They're great. I'm also a National Heritage Responder. Um, it's a really useful resource, so yeah. All right, moving on to a less stressful agent of deterioration. I'll talk about pests. Pests can be a lot of different things. Pests can be insects, like you probably think maybe the first thing that comes to your mind might be clothes moss who are munching on your wool sweaters in the winter. Those are a kind of pest. Our pests can also be mice. Mice, we don't like mice. Um, we also have birds and bats, and we have microorganisms like mold. All of these kinds of pests can cause damage to the things that we're trying to protect. They can cause physical damage, like I mentioned before, things breaking or, or being chewed on. They can cause staining from uh, excretia, and they can cause health and safety concerns. So mold, I don't know how many people are familiar with like the lung damage uh, sensitivity that mold can cause in people. If you're exposed to a lot of mold, it can make you really sick. Um, even a little bit of mold over time can make you really sick. Uh, animal excretia, like, like mouse poop or bird poop, can also make you sick. I used to work in Arizona, and when we would go into a house with uh, suspected mouse poop in it, we'd have to fully gear up in like full personal protective gear and respirators and everything, coveralls, just because the risk of hantavirus there was so high. So it's uh, quite quite risky to be around uh, pest pest residue. We don't like them. Um, and mice also like gnaw on things. Um, it's just, they can cause a lot of damage. So how can we avoid pest damage on our stuff? So the number one tip is just to do regular housekeeping. It's really for two reasons. The first reason is that um, pests like to be in spaces that are kind of messy. It's less comforting and familiar for them to be in like a nice clean space. They're less likely to wanna be in a space like that. And the second reason is if they're in a nice clean space, it's really easy for you to tell immediately that something's wrong. If you see uh, like webbing or debris or something, like there was just a mouse in my kitchen cupboard and we saw rice falling onto our plates from one of the other kitchen cupboards and we were right away like, oh, something's wrong. It was a mouse. So you can tell right away when something's wrong. A really good, important way to, monitor, to know that you have a pest problem is just to know that you're watching for pests and you see their, see their signs that there's pest activity. And the number one way to monitor for pest activity is to have your stuff somewhere where you can monitor it. And so this is the first time, but not the last time that I'm gonna say this. I really, really encourage you to keep your valuable stuff in your main living space of your house instead of in your attic or your basement. I know that people really like to store things in attics and basements because that's where we have a lot of room for storage. But um, specifically for pests, pests like to be in dark, quiet places that are kind of damp and 
those might sound familiar. Those are kind of like the kind of spaces that we find in attics and basements. If you have things that are stored in the main living spaces of your house, they're less likely to get attacked by pests, and you're more likely to see evidence of the pests happen a lot faster if they're like right there where you're living every single day rather than a place where you go less frequently. So you're less likely to encounter pest damage if it's in a main floor closet or somewhere like that. And I love giving this piece of advice. If you do happen to have pest damage, especially if it's like a moth or uh, like some sort of insect, the way to treat that item to kill the bugs is to bag it and freeze it. So um, the bag I usually recommend is like a clear plastic garbage bag. You can throw that, uh, tie it up, tie a knot in it, throw it in your chest freezer, leave it for a couple of weeks, take it out again, let it cool down for like 24 hours, or let it warm up for like 24 hours. Um, and because we live in Minnesota, we have to do something a little tricky. This is what I like to recommend. You let it warm up for 24 hours, let any surviving bugs think that they're in the clear and then freeze it again so that they actually die. So our Minnesota bugs are kind of hardy sometimes and you have to trick them. Uh, so that's a really good way to kill like a, a moth or a carpet, carpet beetle or something like that. All right, light damage. Light is a really important agent of deterioration and it's a tricky one because obviously light can cause a lot of damage to our things, but we also want light to be a part of our lives because otherwise, how are we going to see and enjoy the things that we have, right? Um, if we just keep them in a dark closet all the time, then we're never gonna be able to enjoy looking at our stuff or like seeing them and sharing them with people. So we have to sort of balance the light damage with the light that we need to access our stuff. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Light damage can cause a lot of, lot of problems. It can be light, light damage can be caused by both the visible and the UV component of light. And so you might ask, what is the visible and UV component of light? Well, visible light is the part that you can see, and UV component of light is the part that you can't see, but that still causes damage. So uh, an easy way to reduce the amount of damage caused by light is to eliminate the UV component that's something that you can't see that causes damage. Just get rid of it, right? Seems really easy. The way to get rid of UV component of light is to use only LED light bulbs in your house. Don't use any other kinds of light bulbs and to keep your stuff away from windows because the sun also has a lot of UV in it. That's why we wear sunscreen. So um, if you're using LED light bulbs and keeping your stuff away from windows, you're doing already a great job of decreasing the amount of light damage that your stuff will be getting. So that's one step. Light damage looks like fading, probably you've that's like the number one thing that you think of when you think of light damage, fading and bleaching. But it can also cause embrittlement, and yellowing. Think of like an old newspaper, how it gets yellow, yellow and brittle. It can cause weakening and breaking of things as well. And light damage is cumulative and it is irreversible. So after something has been exposed to light, you can't take it out of the light and put it in a closet and like wait for it to get better over time. It's not gonna rest and improve. It's always gonna be damaged. But we can also use that to our advantage, the fact that it's cumulative. We can do some very simple math to make things make sense. So say you have a very precious quilt that you wanna share with your family. Um, you could have it on display for an entire year, for 12 months or you could take it out of your closet and put it on display for one month of the year, say December, when your family is gonna be around a lot. Um, you could have it out for the month of December every year and you could put it on display for 12 years and it would get the same amount of light damage in 12 years as it would get for one year if it was out for that entire year. So if you do this very simple math, you can see that 
putting it in the dark and only bringing it out for special occasions or for a short periods of time extends the life of those objects for like a much longer period of time than just having them out all the time. So let's talk a little bit more about what we can do. So we can switch our bulbs to LEDs. We can keep items on display away from direct sunlight. Another great trick is to display copies of things instead of the originals. This is great for photographs and for original documents that we want to put on display. Nobody can tell if it's an original or a copy. Put the original in dark storage somewhere, put it in a folder or a box and display a copy of it. I always recommend storing things in the dark, preferably in boxes, well labeled so you know where they are and what's in the box. And then limit the amount of time things are on display. Some things you can't make a copy of. You can't make a copy of a quilt very easily. So if you want to display it, which you should, you should be allowed and able to display things that are special to you that are sensitive to light, like a quilt or a dress or something like that, but just uh, only display it for shorter periods of time instead of all of the time. And there's uh, one picture that I really want to draw your attention to. It's the picture in the middle here. This is a picture of like a silk square or a silk triangle, really, in a crazy quilt. And I like to draw people's attention to it because this is what happens to silk when it's been exposed to light. Silk is extremely delicate and very sensitive to light. It has this phenomena called shattering. When it's been exposed to light for a certain amount of time, it's not even that long, historic silks and even modern silks will basically like, like the fiber will explode. <laughs> they, can't, uh, they can't maintain their integrity with, uh, with exposure to light. So you can see that this patch of silk has not only faded, it's completely disintegrated and there's nothing left. It's just like strings hanging there. So if you have items that are silk, it's wise to be very, very cautious about how much light you are exposing them to. All right, let's talk about incorrect relative humidity. You may be wondering, what does incorrect relative humidity mean? Well, it can mean damage caused by relative humidity that is too high or too low or fluctuating, high, low, too fast. So what happens with your humidity and the things that you own? Well, let's skip metals, but like for most of the things around you that are made from like organic material, so things that are like of the earth, for example, not like stones or metals or stuff. When the humidity in, in a room changes, it, these materials absorb humidity when it's really humid and they release humidity when it's dry. And so they expand in humid settings and contract when it's not humid anymore. And when different materials are in contact with each other, they'll expand and contract at different rates, and that can cause weird issues like splitting and cracking and curling, which you can see in these pictures here, you can see splits and cracks, um, and the curling photographs too, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with curling photographs. High humidity is also what's most likely to cause mold damage. And high humidity will also cause uh, corrosion and rust on metals. Um, high humidity or incorrect relative humidity in general can be caused by the climate, heating and cooling of a building, water intrusion like leaks or floods inside of a building, or condensation on a window, even small things like that. My advice is to avoid storage in attics and basements because those are the places where we're most likely to get weird issues with our humidity. As I'm sure everybody knows, that's often where we get really damp basements and then we have to put our dehumidifiers down there. Um, I also uh, like to advise people to use display cases, frames, and storage boxes to store things in or even to display things in because they can help buffer shifts in the humidity. So let's picture like a traditional fall day in Minnesota. In the morning, 
it's pouring buckets of rain. It's like 100% humidity outside. And then in the afternoon, a wind comes in, it dries everything out, and suddenly it's like 25% humidity outside. These are really big shifts in the humidity. But if something's inside a box, the humidity inside the box is probably just gonna stay the same for that entire period of time. It's not gonna have time to adjust to the changes of humidity that are happening outside the box because it's buffered by the box itself. So by keeping things inside of cases and frames and storage boxes, we're, protect we're adding a layer of protection to the, box to the item itself. Just like the humidity inside our house is buffered from the crazy humidity swings that happen outside as well. Um, so what we have, what I have here as the, the last bullet point are the recommended conditions for museum gallery, <laughs> for museums. Recommended conditions for museums are 40% to 60% relative humidity. These are really, really difficult to achieve even in museums. So this isn't like, these aren't the relative humidity guidelines that I'm giving to you to try to achieve in your homes to preserve your items. Even in museums, very difficult to achieve this. But what I'm uh, trying to show here is that for your objects and for the things that we're trying to protect, the relative humidity that they like are set kind of the same relative humidity that we as people also like, kind of right in the middle. We don't like it to be too humid, and we don't like it to be too dry. We kind of like a middle of the road humidity. Objects are the same. Almost all objects like it to be sort of right in the middle. In your house, for the things that you're trying to protect, the main, the main thing to keep in mind is trying to provide an environment where you're avoiding extremes of like super high humidity and super low humidity. Um, and in the winter, that can be really hard to avoid a super low humidity. Um, so you have to do the best you can for the, the winter is really hard. But in the, the summer, um, the really, really high humidity that can result in mold, that's like, if you keep things in your main living space, that's gonna help you avoid mold damage on your stuff. All right. Moving on to incorrect temperature. High temperature can cause things to melt, warp, to become sticky, and things that are plastic are more likely to deteriorate rather quickly. And I'm sure people have experienced um, plastics that become kind of sticky when they're older. That's uh, plastics deteriorating, and we don't like that. Um, low temperatures, meanwhile, will make things more brittle and prone to break. So. Low temperatures aren't actually that bad for preserving things, but if you're trying to handle things and, it's, and they're cold, that can make them more difficult to handle without breaking them. Fluctuating temperatures will cause the same problems as fluctuating humidity. They're actually tied together, so you'll get the same kinds of problems. What to do about incorrect temperature? Avoid storage in attics and basements, same reasons. Um, Avoid storage or display in direct sunlight or above radiators because these are like hot spots in our houses. Um, they might seem like they're the same temperature as everywhere else, but they're actually quite a bit hotter. And also, it's important to think about digitizing your sensitive film formats. So if you have anything that is a nitrate, acetate, on cassettes or on VHS tapes, it's really important to start thinking about digitizing them onto more stable formats. So VHS tapes and these other film formats are really sensitive to falling apart and uh, like they don't, they don't have a very long lifespan anymore. Um, if they're still in good condition, they're probably not gonna be in very good condition for very much longer just because of the nature of the format itself. Unfortunately, like the main way that we have to preserve them is to put them in refrigerated storage right now. So unless you have an extra fridge that you can store all your VHS tapes in, I recommend trying to get them digitized into a different format so that you can keep them long term and you can share your family, family videos in the future or whatever else that you have on like nitrate, acetate, or cassettes. Recommended conditions for storing things are 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, um, again, pretty much human comfort level temperatures. 
All right, thieves and vandals. This is uh, like a pretty unique one for people at home. It's uh, not something that I can give blanket advice on because everybody has a different situation. I can't, I can't tell you that you're at risk of arson um, without knowing your particular situation. Hopefully nobody here is at risk of arson or theft, um, but maybe you have a Van Gogh in your house that I don't know about, or maybe you're like a really outspoken uh, political figure that I don't know about either, so I wouldn't want to give you advice without knowing your specific situation. But if you are concerned about your risk for uh, damage due to a security issue, I do recommend uh, going through and making a risk assessment for yourself. I recommend for everyone to do an inventory. Um, if you have, it doesn't even matter if it's for valuable stuff, it's just good practice in general for insurance purposes to go through and take pictures of the things that you own or like do a video walkthrough of your house because if something were to happen, you wouldn't get like paid out for the things that you own unless you have a list of all the things that you own. But this is particularly important for your valuables and stuff like that. If you have a large collection of baseball cards, for example, how, you don't know what baseball cards you have. You're never going to get like reimbursed for those baseball cards if there were if there were a disaster and you wanted to get insurance money for them, for example. Um, so, if you do know that you have some possible risks and you'd like them to get mitigated, you need to think specifically about what the risks are. So, if you have, uh, say. Uh, like an outdoor sculpture that's very valuable. Maybe the risk that you want is uh, to mitigate is uh, people walking through your neighborhood at night. You'd want to put like an outdoor light outside that shines down on the sculpture so that when people walk through, the light turns on and it's bright, brightened outside, something like that. So security measures might include display cases, security cameras, limited key access, things like that. All right, moving on to water damage. When it comes to emergency situations that affect our stuff, water damage is like the most common kind of emergency. We see it all the time. It can happen from leaks, it can happen from floods, it can happen from condensation on windows, it can be a catastrophic flood like the Red River, like the Red River, uh, it can be a minor flood, like from a uh, toilet overflowing. It could be all sorts of different levels, and it doesn't really matter because once your stuff is wet and damaged, it still takes the same kinds of skills and techniques and knowledge to try to protect them and save them from the water damage. And the good thing is that most things can be salvaged once they're wet. You just have to have the right knowledge and tools to be able to do it. Um, the most important thing to know is that after things have been wet for like more than 72 hours is usually the number that we say, mold will start growing on them and we don't like mold. Um, other th types of things to be worried about when things are wet is physical damage and distortion like, the, like that book, <laughs> staining, running of inks and dyes, tide lines. Hardening and shrinking of surfaces like leather. Leather gets really hard and gross when it gets wet. Um, corrosion and rust on metal and blanching of varnishes. This refers to like, if you, you're probably all familiar with if somebody puts a wet cup down on a tabletop without using a coaster and it makes that, that little mark on the wood varnish. Um, that's like the same sort of phenomenon as blanching. It's the water getting into the varnish. So how can we protect ourselves from water damage? Well, one tip is to avoid storing things in attics and basements because that's where the water, where water is most likely to come into our homes. In the attic, it's most likely, that's the first place where water is going to come in in a leak probably. And in the basement, that's the first place water is most likely to come in in a flood. It's important to perform regular building maintenance to prevent these kinds of problems from occurring, like cleaning your gutters and stuff like that. And I also, again, recommend storing things in boxes, frames, and display cases to add a layer of protection. More than once, I've um, worked with people or talked to people who had stored things in a box, and the box got wet in an emergency. 
and they were able to take things out of the box and they were dry. The box, just garbage. Box is wet and mushy, so they can just throw it out and the things inside are perfectly safe. But if the thing hadn't been inside a box, they would have had a whole different problem on their hands because they would have had to try to salvage and dry out the thing itself instead of just throwing out the box. So it's a whole, it's a whole benefit to having things stored nicely inside of boxes or frames. And again, this is another great time to contact uh, the National Heritage Responders. If things get wet and you don't know what to do and uh, you need some advice, you can contact this helpline and they are uh, ready to answer questions about how to safely dry things out. All right, pollutants, and we're getting there. We're almost through all 10 agents of deterioration. Pollutants might be a weird one for you, but it's damage caused by gases and fine particles in the air like dust. Pollutant damage can look like corrosion, rust, or tarnish on silver. It can cause staining, dust and dirty deposits on things, and even chemical breakdown of some materials. Common sources include car exhaust, ozone, indoor furnishings like wood and particle board, and the use of non-archival storage materials like PVC. And now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about these pictures. So the picture in the middle, this is a picture from my grandfather's coin collection. So when he was collecting coins, he was dutifully putting all of his coins in these little coin envelopes that were marketed specifically for storing your coins in. Um, and he probably thought he was doing like, like what he was supposed to, a really great thing for protecting your coins. Um, but what he was doing was putting his coins in PVC envelopes. And I have seen to this very day places that market PVC packages as archival. PVC releases hydrochloric acid vapors as it deteriorates. And what you can tell from this picture, perhaps, is that this copper coin is like green around the edges, and that's because the acidic vapors from the PVC envelope are tarnishing the copper coin as, as it ages. And so this penny is turning green. It's a coin collection, so obviously this is affecting the value of the coin negatively because it's corroding, it looks green, and the plastic's all sticky and gross now. Um, so you should not use PVC to store things in because it's really bad. It turns things green <laughs> and it doesn't, it's not archival. It's really bad for your stuff. Um, but places will still try to sell you PVC things as archival. So it's a lesson learned that you can't trust the word archival when you're shopping. The word archival itself doesn't necessarily mean that things are archival. You have to look specifically at the materials that are being used and not just the, the words and the phrases that are being used. So polyvinyl chloride, PVC, not a safe material to use. And the other thing I wanted to show you in the next picture, this is a picture of a wood frame that is being used. And uh, on this wood frame, you can see that the wood knot has left this brown acidic scorch mark on the piece of paper. That's just from being in close contact with the wood for many years. And that's because um, wood also releases organic acidic vapors as it ages. And those vapors have uh, like essentially burned the paper over years and left this brown stain on the paper. Now, Wood is kind of uh, a difficult subject because a lot of people use wood furniture in their homes. Um, and what I would say is that you don't need to throw out all of your wood furniture in your home to display your things. You can keep your wood furniture. But if you're looking for a new piece of furniture to display things on, like your collections on, I wouldn't recommend buying new wood furniture to display or store things on. It's better to use inert materials like glass or metal or things like that than to buy new wood furniture. And definitely don't use particle board because particle board releases formaldehyde, which is definitely not something you want near your stuff. 
Um, so what to do, make sure you're using archivally safe storage and display materials, avoid PVC. Um, you can use air filters with a high filtration rating if you live near a highway or something like that and you wanna make sure you have clean air in your home. Regular housekeeping will keep dust levels down and avoid wood and particle board furniture for storage and display. But again, older wood furniture, the acidic vapors have already dispersed from it. It's not an active threat anymore. New wood furniture will be more acidic and so I would avoid using new wood furniture. All right, this is our last agent of deterioration and perhaps the most difficult to comprehend, but it's not actually difficult once I explain it. Dissociation is the loss of information or the loss of the object itself. It can mean misplacing something, losing its paperwork, forgetting why it's valuable, accidental disposal, or digital uh, formats becoming obsolete. For example, floppy disks. We don't use those anymore. If you have any floppy disks, you probably can't access the information that's on them anymore. The larger your collection, the more difficult it is to keep track of everything. So that's why museums have a big problem and take a lot of time and effort to make sure they keep track of everything really well. But even in our homes, it's really important to make sure we're taking care of things, to make sure we know what everything is. So how to keep things safe? I recommend labeling things in storage so that you know what everything is. I recommend keeping an inventory of your stuff so that you know what you have and where it is. You can organize all of your paperwork in one place instead of having it scattered in different places. And this is a really great piece of advice um, that I've gotten from different people is to record the stories of your family heirlooms in order to remember why they're important to you and your family. And I say this from experience because I have a lot of different things that my mom gave me that I don't remember why she gave them to me or who they belong to, which grandma they used to be from or why I should keep them. And I'm like, I know that this is old and special, but I don't remember why. So it would be really nice if I had taken a note down when she gave them to me. And another piece of information that I really want to stress to everyone is not to throw things away after they've been digitized. So you might know of people or maybe even you digitize your photos to share them on Facebook or other platforms. And this is a really great way to share photos and stuff, old family photos, but don't throw out the photos afterwards because it's really, really hard to keep up with digital file formats. They change all the time. It's really hard to make sure that you're saving them in the right places and that Different servers don't crash, or you don't lose track of where things are saved properly. It's actually a lot of work to save things in a digital file format, and it's a lot easier to save the physical version of it than it is to save the digital version. So I think that you should remember, you should preserve the physical version and use the digital version just for sharing. And that is a, just a way easier way to go about it. So. That is all of the agents. So here are my recommendations for finding additional resources, and these are also in your handouts. So if you need to find a conservator to help you with a, like a more complicated project or something like that, this, the first email address is a simple email address that you can use to contact me. It's just conservation at mnhs.org. That will go directly to me. Another website that you can use to find conservators is the Preservation Specialists Directory at mnhs.org. This will take you to a directory of all sorts of different preservation people who do cool things um, in Minnesota at mnhs. That's uh, a directory on our website. And then the third link is the Professional Organization of Conservators. Uh, there's a whole a uh, directory of peer-reviewed conservators from across the country that you can search to find a conservator near you. All right, for finding uh, archival supplies, really useful, I created this website, um, which has a really long URL right now, but it's called Finding Archival Supplies for Preservation. And if you just typed that in and typed MNHS, it would probably pop up on Google instead of having to type in the URL. Um, but it just, it lists a lot more information about how to know what's archival and what's not, and 
it's really a handy uh, link to explain what kind of plastics are good and what kind of plastics aren't good. Um, but if you want to even skip all that, there are three websites here that I consider generally trustworthy places to find archival supplies. There are more places where you can find archival supplies than those three places. These are just places to start. If you have an emergency that affects your stuff and you want advice on what to do next, these three places are great places to look for more resources. If you want to learn more about a pest that's destroying things and what to do next, this is the only resource you need. It has every piece of information you could possibly want to find about museum pests. These are just some more generally trustworthy pieces of information. These websites have information about like so many cool topics, um, like how to polish silver to like how to build uh, an emergency go-kart uh, to like, I don't even know. You can learn so many, so many really interesting facts. So if you are really interested in the subject and you want to dive into it a little bit more, these are really great places to go look. <laughs>